Hello everyone, this is Ken from Paragon Vision, and this web session this evening uh, featuring Dr. Barry Iden is co-sponsored by Paragon Vision Sciences and Oculus USA. We certainly thank you for attending this evening. Now this is the first of three installments that Dr. Iden will be presenting on corneal reshaping. And this first installment will be uh, corneal reshaping in the primary eye care practice. Now, uh, Dr. Iden, of course, is a well-known author and lecturer. He serves as the chair of the contact lens and cornea section of the American Optometric Association, amongst many other um, at the university, uh, Salus University, is uh, adjunct faculty member. Um, he's a great, great lecturer and speaker. So uh, without any further ado, I'm just going to hand this over to Dr. Iden. And uh, um, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the question box. And then Dr. Iden will be happy to answer as many as time allows at the end of the session. So. Dr. Iden, please, it's the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ken, and uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this first of, as Ken said, three webinars that we'll pre we will be presenting on the topic of corneal reshaping in a primary eye care practice. Uh, I'll have the pleasure of actually um, presenting two of those webinars, and my uh, associate and partner, Dr. Dan Press, will be doing uh, one of those uh, webinars, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, the goal of these webinars is really to present basic concepts of corneal reshaping and how one might be able to incorporate them into a general eye care or primary eye care practice. So we're going to talk about basic concepts, basic uh, ideas and issues, and how you can be successful in bringing them into a, an established primary care practice. I um, personally have been involved in corneal reshaping uh, even before the uh, FDA uh, approval of corneal reshaping well over 10 years ago now and um, have been able to treat thousands of uh, individuals successfully and it has become an integral part of our uh, multi-specialty practice. Uh, I'm involved both in private practice and in uh, academic practice as well and uh, once again bringing corneal reshaping into our practice has been quite a rewarding aspect. So I want to share those, uh, those ideas and how we were able to become successful over the years as well. So we'll get going. Just one moment. Okay, once again, I want to do, of course, I want to thank our co-sponsors, both Paragon and Oculus. They've been extremely supportive uh, in putting on various webinars to help um, educate our doctors of optometry and ophthalmology uh, in the areas of uh, cornea, cornea disease, uh, contact lenses, and such. So thank you to those uh, co-sponsors. Now, uh, if anybody is interested in any information that I present in this or the other webinars, please feel free to contact me via my email address that you can see up here uh, this evening at sbeiden at nsvc.com. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions via email. If you would like uh, a copy of this presentation, it's my pleasure to share it with you, so on and so forth. So please feel free to contact me at this email address. So modern corneal reshaping, we now know without question, is a valid clinical option. Surely those of us who got involved with it at the beginning had to deal with a lot of naysayers, those who said there wasn't good clinical data to uh, confirm the efficacy of this treatment or the safety of this treatment as well. But those questions have been answered over and over again over the past decade plus through just large numbers of studies. These are just some of them. And what's really interesting is that not only are these studies found in optometric literature, but significant number of these studies have been published in referee journals within ophthalmology. So um, we now know that without a doubt, corneal reshaping is a valid clinical vision correction option with significant efficacy and safety. Uh, we talked 
about FDA approval, and I think that goes a long way in practice. I have to say, even at the beginning, when we just first started doing corneal reshaping, once we got FDA approval, uh, the ability to talk to patients, talk to patients' uh, parents, if, if they were young people, and tell them that this is an FDA-approved methodology, that does go a long way. And Paragon, with their CRT system, got their approval back in 2002, and that was followed with Bausch & Lomb's approval for their vision shaping treatment, or VST, in December of 2004, and a number of specific designs now fall under the banner of Bausch & Lomb vision shaping treatment, as you can see here. <clears throat> all, and the one message I do want to get across, probably tonight many times, is that all of these various designs are effective. All of them work, and all of them do a really good job. So who is it for corneal reshaping? What, what patients might be interested in undergoing this treatment? Well, first of all, we realize that it's a non-surgical alternative for vision correction for adult patients, first of all, who are adverse to refractive surgery. These are patients who maybe aren't quite the risk taker as others who have undergone refractive surgery. So these patients might have concerns about the permanence and the risk. So we always talk about in corneal reshaping the fact that it, its strength and its weakness is its non-permanence. The fact that compared to refractive surgery, surely we have to do a treatment over and over again in order to get its effect. But the beauty is that if for any reason we want to discontinue this treatment, we can go back to baseline where we started. Not so, obviously, with refractive surgery. It's also quite um, attractive to adolescents and young patients who are below approved ages for refractive surgery and for whose myopic uh, prescription is progressive, as we all know we'll talk about time and again, one of the great strengths of corneal reshaping. And this, again, has been shown uh, in well-controlled clinical trials that corneal reshaping has a significant positive effect on thwarting the advance of myopia and progressive myopes. So for people who want to be free from glasses and contacts during their daily lives, there are so many things we do where uh, both contacts and even more so glasses can kind of get in the way or present uh, a problem. These are the patients who corneal reshaping is an option. So if we have patients who are interested in undergoing corneal reshaping, well, what would make them a good candidate? What would make them a bad candidate? Here are some basic guidelines to consider. The first thing you need to consider is the degree of myopia or nearsightedness. And understand that currently, FDA approval for corneal reshaping in the United States is for myopia. Although there are designs and methodologies to treat other conditions, such as hyperopia, it is currently not FDA approved in the United States. So we're going to be talking about myopic uh, correction. And depending upon uh, the design, uh, FDA has given approval for myopic correction anywhere from five to six diopters. Paragon CRT has gotten up to six diopters of approval for six diopters of correction. And for the Bausch & Lomb VST, up to five diopters. But we all agree that keeping the um, myopia at or below four diopters is optimal. Surely we can treat higher degrees, but when we go for higher degrees, the success rates start to go down, and some of the um, issues that uh, present a challenge for corneal reshaping will increase when you're trying to create corrections for higher degrees of myopia. So especially those of you who have not delved into this area yet, I believe it's always great to get a lot of success under your belt first. And that's what we try to do. So to be very honest with you, I think if you're starting out in corneal reshaping for the first time, take the first six months or so and just try to treat patients under minus three, anywhere from minus a half, minus 75 to minus three. Your success rate are going to, will be very, very high. Uh, the positive feedback will be very high as well. And you're going to create a, a stir of good uh, vibes at your practice, so to speak. You'll have people who are there saying that this is just a wonderful treatment. Why? Because when we're dealing with patients of that degree of myopia, uh, to be very honest with you, most of them are a slam dunk. They just do really, really well in this form of therapy. When you were dealing with astigmatism, it's not so much that approved methods of cornea, corneal reshaping today in the United States are directly correcting astigmatism purposefully, but 
we can account for astigmatism. What we mean by that, there may be mild degrees of reduction secondarily, uh, and there may not be significant implications of any smaller degrees of residual astigmatism. So in terms of approval, anything up to a diopter and a half is approved. But obviously, the lower the degree, the greater uh, success we're going to get, and orientation is important. With the rule of stigmatism tends to respond a bit better than against the rule of stigmatism. So if you have two patients, both with one diopter of astigmatism and their refractive correction, um, those that are uh, axis 90 or against the rule are probably going to have a bit uh, more trouble with residual astigmatism than those with axis 180 uh, or with the rule of stigmatism. An important thing to keep in mind that with the FDA approval, there are no age restrictions. There's nothing indicated in the FDA approval that treatment can only be uh, given to patients above or below a certain age. Um, I think the key element here is the ability to appropriately apply this type of treatment to an individual. Do we have a mature young person? Do we have supportive parents if they're young? So we've had a lot of success in treating seven-year-olds time and time again, for example, at our practice, who are progressive myopes. Uh, some of them are mature enough to actually uh, insert and remove the lenses themselves well. Even some of them are taking care of their lenses in terms of cleaning this infection on their own, while others are a bit more dependent on parental uh, help. But either way, there is no FDA restriction on age for this treatment. So at our practice, the youngest we've ever treated was six and a half years old, and the oldest we ever started with was 63 years old. So it's quite a, an age range in our practice. Uh, of course, we again mention progressive myopic uh, prescription uh, are really something to consider. So many studies today uh, have come out showing the advantage of corneal reshaping and slowing down and sometimes thwarting the uh, advance of myopia, especially in young progressive myopes. And uh, many of these studies, and some of which we've been involved with, uh, have been well controlled and well performed. And surely uh, it's something that we can say clinically, although there's no FDA approval yet for myopia stabilization, there is enough well-controlled data, in my opinion, to uh, state this to individuals. Uh, those with active lifestyles obviously are great candidates as well uh, because they want to be free of glasses. And even some of them in dusty environments, contact lenses present a challenge as well. So are there contraindications? You know, for sure there are contraindications. And understand that whenever we're talking about any form of medical contraindication, they can be relative contraindications or absolute in contraindications. Absolute means that without question, if they have a certain condition, they should not have a certain treatment um, performed. And relative means maybe it depends upon the degree of this condition in making your decision to move forward or not. Maybe it, it depends upon expectations of the patient, that this relative contraindication perhaps can lower the success rate or perhaps not uh, result in quite as good uh, visual acuity, uh, but yet it can be done. So what are some things we might want to be concerned about? Patients with keratoconus and other forms of corneal ectasia, like pellucid marginal degeneration. These patients cannot respond to this form of therapy in a predictive way. Now, that being said, there are individuals throughout the world who have tried to utilize corneal reshaping to mold the corneas of these kinds of patients with the goal that when they remove the lens, that they would have a bit better functional uncorrected vision and to some degree a bit better uh, functional corrected vision with spectacles. Um, again, not FDA approved for this. Uh, it is controversial uh, and concerning. So I would definitely put these conditions under uh, the banner of contraindication. Same would deal with other forms of corneal irregularity and non-orthogonal astigmatism. They can be induced by many, induced by many factors, trauma, surgery, even contact lens uh, corneal distortion. We have to be careful about. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, here's a relative one, uh, limbus to limbus astigmatism. We know uh, from experience that if we fit spherical design uh, corneal reshaping lenses uh, on patients with limbus to limbus forms of astigmatism, that they will have uh, lower degrees of correction of corneal astigmatism and higher rates of superior corneal flattening. That happens because these lenses tend to decenter. 
but there are designs like the Paragon dual axis design that can be utilized to better center these lenses on the eyes and give better outcomes. So this would not be a, rel a, con a absolute, an absolute contraindication, it would be a relative contraindication. Uh, okay. So here are just some examples, as you can see in your uh, upper left side, a uh, Pentacam analysis of uh, the case of keratoconus. In the upper right, a global uh, pachymetry from a pentacam on a pellucid marginal degeneration with a shine fluke image on the right showing that um, inferior uh, localized thinning just inside the limbus, as you can see where I'm going to point. Uh, well, I guess the arrow can't point exactly to it, but you can see it in that area. And then inferiorly, we see an example of rigid lens-induced, contact lens-induced distortion. So if we're going to consider corneal reshaping for these kinds of patients, let's say they're wearing contact lenses and there is some irregularity or distortion that we believe is contact lens-induced, and by the way, it's not exclusive to rigid lenses, it can happen in soft lenses as well, then you want to keep the patients out of their lenses for a period of time until their corneal topography uh, normalizes and stabilizes as well. Very important. Now there, are, of course, are labeled contraindications for corneal reshaping, and you can see them here. They are quite logical patients who have active acute uh, or subacute inflammation of the anterior segment, significant eye diseases of the anterior segment, tear film uh, insufficiencies that are significant and such. Now, we all know that these wouldn't be good patients to fit in any form of contact lens. So we use that same sort of logic, that same sort of rational approach in dealing with patients in corneal um, reshaping. Does this mean that patients with these conditions cannot do corneal reshaping? The answer is no, of course they can. We need to manage these conditions properly first, quiet them down, get them under control, and then one can consider uh, corneal reshaping. And surely mild degrees of dry eye, we have many patients who with daytime contacts have contact lens associated dry eye and have trouble wearing their lenses. And when they are um, treated with corneal reshaping, they actually do better because during the day they don't have those symptoms. So, you know, once, once again, these conditions, although they're contraindications, if managed and controlled, patients can still in many cases uh, have corneal reshaping uh, treatment done. So let's assume we have selected our patient. Uh, they're a good candidate. They have no significant contraindications. We want to get started in actually uh, performing corneal reshaping. What do we need? What do we need in our practice? Well, this is really important. Office systems. I'm a firm believer that if you're going to bring corneal reshaping into your practice, you must dedicate yourself to this form of treatment. The same holds true in refractive surgery. Those practices that want to bring LASIK, PRK into their practice, they can't dabble in it. They have to have systems in place. They have to have um, methods to do it in an organized way. The same holds true for corneal reshaping. So you have to establish your clinical care systems in your office. How are we going to do workups? How are we going to do aftercare? How are we going to monitor our patients? An important element is staff education. The staff has to understand this therapy. So of course, first the doctor needs to be educated and feel comfortable. From there, the doctor must educate the staff. This is not only important in terms of providing excellent care for our patients, but it's, it's huge in terms of the ability to promote this form of treatment. Our technicians, our front desk, even our opticians uh, do a phenomenal job in communicating with patients about the benefits of corneal reshaping and for consideration for many patients in having this treatment done. Patient educational information is very, very important. Handouts explaining not only the procedure itself, what to expect, what's involved, but also in terms of office policies, both financial and clinical. So our patients are given a, um, a folder that has great amounts of information about the treatment, but also has our, our office policies in terms of finances, our office policies, and what's expected in terms of aftercare, what patients should be doing, so on and so forth, and has informed consent as well. I think it's important to get this all in order before we actually start. Now, the last of our seminars, uh, which will occur in August, I believe it's the 14th, if I am not mistaken, um, we're going to go over a lot of these elements that I'm going to share with you, examples of what we do in our practice. 
Uh, you have to establish your office policies. What about patients who decide within a fitting period that they're going to discontinue corneal reshaping? What are your policies about that? Consent forms, so on and so forth. Very important to have office systems. What about instrumentation? What do we have to have in our office to perform corneal reshaping? Well, of course, you have to have the ability to do really excellent objective and subjective uh, refraction. So we happen to have uh, excellent autorefractors and, of course, doing manifest and, in many cases, cycloplegic refractions are very ha helpful. Because bottom line is we're trying to treat the refractive errors. So having an excellent, accurate, and repeatable baseline refraction is very important for us to determine and design what lenses are going to be used to correct that. Uh, the ability to measure corneal curvature, even with manual or automated keratometry. Slit lamp exam, and of course, uh, the ability to use ratten filters, so we, because we do use uh, fluorescein evaluations and looking at lenses on the eyes. Measurement of corneal shape, corneal shape analysis, utilizing corneal topography or tomography, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Although not required by any of the companies, I believe, to absolutely utilize their corneal reshaping systems, it surely should be a must. And in all honesty, I, I would never suggest that one get involved in corneal reshaping without having some measure of corneal shape via topography or tomography in, in their practice. And there are optional advanced technologies that one might consider, things like specular microscopy to establish a baseline of endothelial cell health and to monitor that. In our practice, we perform specular microscopy at the initial consultation and baseline, and we perform it annually on our corneal reshaping patients. Uh, same holds true in the ability to perform aberometry. Not necessary to do corneal reshaping, but it's kind of nice, because if you do it as a baseline, you'll know those patients who already have high order aberrations. And there's a potential, to be honest, and there are articles written about this, that in some cases, when you perform corneal reshaping, you might induce greater degrees of high order aberrations. We also perform um, quantified pupillometry, uh, utilizing a um, infrared-based system because we kind of want to know what the patient's pupil is like, as we know those who have large pupils and those that dilate even greater in dark illumination may have more problems because our treatment zone may not, not uh, go out far enough and patients can have problems secondary to that. So that's an important uh, measure in, in our opinion. A dry eye diagnosis, and one can do that in many ways, whether it's things like uh, tear film osmolarity, just physical assessment of the tear film, um, vital staining, all the way up to automated measures like utilization of Oculus's um, keratograph system, which has a tremendous dry eye software suite, looking at non-invasive tear breakup time, tear meniscus height, such like that, are really great baseline data points to help us know who are patients that maybe their eyes are a bit too dry to, uh, to perform corneal reshaping, and we need to address that before moving forward. Um, so those are some of the things that we utilize. They're not absolutely required, but they are uh, quite helpful. Critical is deciding what design options you want to utilize in your practice. You saw that list of lenses that are approved by the FDA. Paragon has a, a number of design systems, and under the Bauchelon VST, there are many designs. Do we have to utilize all of them? No, absolutely not. Do they all work pretty well? Yes, they all work quite well. In my opinion, have your go-to design and maybe one or two backups. And if your go-to design, you're probably going to use 90% of the time, and then your backups, you'll fill in that last uh, 10%. And how do you know which to choose? Well, to me, a lot of it depends upon lab relationships, your relationships with the laboratories, the ability to communicate the support that you get from the laboratories. Um, and the ability to uh, problem solve along with your um, lab consultants. Very, very critical, especially, especially during the early phases of your experience in corneal reshaping. So here are just some uh, images of some of the things that's needed in clinical practice, including corneal, uh, corneal topography and some images of some of the aberrometry systems we use specular microscopy, and you can see down to the inferiorly that handheld instrument is um, our infrared neuroptics pupillometer. So um, these are some of the things to consider when wanting to start corneal reshaping in your practice. So now the patient is in front of you. You're going to perform your pretreatment evaluation, followed by lens designing and or fitting. What's involved? 
First of all, obviously, a comprehensive history is very important. We need to do that, get all the uh, medical history, the medical eye history, uh, the ocular uh, aspects and visual aspects that influence our outcomes here. Uh, a very accurate refraction. As I mentioned, we uh, are firm believers that you want to get both objective and subjective. And depending upon the case, we'll determine whether we're going to do cycloplegic refractions. Biomicroscopy, complete ocular health evaluation, including tear film testing. <clears throat> and of course, as I mentioned, the ability to measure corneal shape, corneal topographic analysis. These others, uh, things like pupillometry, specular microscopy, aberometry, and such, are uh, more optional. We utilize them in our practice, but they are not absolutely required. Now let's talk about fitting and design. We'll get into this in greater detail in just a few moments. But there are a variety of ways in which you can actually fit patients in corneal reshaping lenses. Utilizing diagnostic corneal reshaping lenses, using empirical fitting strategies, and using topography guided uh, design strategies. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's spend a little time talking about the value of pretreatment corneal shape analysis in corneal reshaping. First value is the detection of abnormalities of the cornea that would be contraindicated for corneal reshaping. We went over that before. Things like keratoconus, pellucid, so on and so forth. Contact lens induced distortion. So you want to rule those kinds of cases out at the beginning. Secondly, and very importantly, is the establishment of a baseline of corneal shape data which will be used to compare to the effects of corneal reshaping on corneal topography. In other words, we have a pretreatment and a post-treatment. We want to see the change analysis. What has our treatment done? This will tell us if it's been effective, if it's being treated appropriately in terms of centration, so on and so forth. So that establishment of baseline is critical. <clears throat> we can also get data from topography certain measures that may have predictive values for outcomes in corneal reshaping. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then topographic analysis to determine the optimal therapeutic lens parameters. What we mean by that is top topography-based fitting, where the actual topography is utilized to uh, design lenses. So let's talk about corneal shape analysis in what I call basics 101 of corneal reshaping under corneal shape analysis. We'll talk about the difference between topography and tomography. We'll talk about various basic map types that we utilize in corneal reshaping. We'll look at some of those key measures or indices that we utilize in corneal reshaping. And we'll know what is the key measures in getting outcomes in corneal reshaping. So what is topography? Well, topography is defined as a detailed representation or description of the surface characteristics of a structure. And of course, we have topography maps. We could have topography of brain structures, as we see in this uh, diagram. But what we use in eye care, typically, and most commonly, is something called placido-based topography. What is placido-based topography? It's video, also known as video keratoscopy, where we reflect concentric rings onto the corneal surface. So a light source reflects these concentric rings onto the corneal surface. And the computer in these topography systems, these placido-based topography systems, will analyze the separation of the rings. Now the greater the separation of the rings at that location will indicate a flatter radius of curvature. And the smaller the separation of the rings, will indicate a steeper radius of curvature. Most of us understand that and know that. So placido-based topography provides a localized measure for us of curvature of the cornea. Again, this is very important. Placido-based topography measures curvature. And it's highly sensitive at detection of localized curvature. But that's what everything else is based off of. So if you have a placido-based topographer that you create a map that's called an elevation or height map, that height map is not true elevation of the cornea. It's inferred or um, calculated elevation based upon the true measure of curvature. Here's an example of a display overview of a placido-based topography system. In this case, it's the Oculus Keratograph system, an excellent uh, placido-based topography system. And we can see the placido rings in the upper left corner. Um, we then see some key. Uh, key statistics that come off of these uh, measures of the separation of those rings, things like the 
curvature along the steep meridian, the curvature along the flat meridian. Those would be called SIM-K, or simulated keratometry readings. We would know, obviously, the axis and meridians of those. We could also see uh, asphericity values or eccentricity values, as well as down at the bottom, we can see a measure of the corneal diameter. And that measure of corneal diameter is actually calculated from white to white measure. So the computer actually draws a cord from one end of the cornea to the other and measures the diameter. And we'll see a little later that corneal diameter is an important finding uh, in corneal shape analysis, specifically in corneal height or sagittal height analysis. Um, in the upper right corner, we can select what type of calculated map we want to put in there. This particular one is a sagittal curvature or axial curvature map showing classic with the rule astigmatism where the steeper meridian is vertical and the horizontal meridian is flatter, separated by 90 degrees. Now that's placido-based topography. So what do we mean by the term tomography? Tomography is a, a tomogram is a two-dimensional image or a slice or section through a three-dimensional object. So you can get CT scans, computerized tomography scans, but in the cornea, what we're measuring through tomography are actual true elevation data. We get true elevation of both the front and the back of the cornea. Now granted, when we're talking about corneal reshaping, posterior corneal curvature is not very important. It's really the anterior corneal uh, elevation curvature and other data that's important for us. We also get global pectimetry uh, from the data from tomography. And we also do get curvature data, both axial and tangential, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this is curvature that is derived from true elevation data. Some people feel that even these curvature values may or may not be more valid than uh, placido-based uh, curvature data. That's still debatable. There are a number of systems uh, out there. Pentacam by Oculus, probably the most popular. Uh, OrbScan by Bausch and & Lohm, and Galilee by Zeimer. Uh, these are three of the tomography uh, systems out there. And you'll see tomography systems utilized, of course, in refractive surgery practices all the time and in uh, practices that do a lot of irregular cornea and corneal ectasia work like our practice does in keratoconus. It's critical in these cases, both refractive surgery and in ectasia, due to the ability to measure posterior cornea. That's why this kind of uh, information is very, very important. Here we can see an overview uh, printout or, or um, display from the Pentacam showing various uh, different measures uh, of the cornea. We'll go into some basics in just a moment. So we talked about identifying some of the key map types that are important in corneal reshaping. Well, one would be the axial or sagittal curvature map, secondly being the tangential curvature map, the refractive power map, and the elevation map. And we'll go over each individually. And we use them for different purposes. One of the things we should consider is the scales that are used whenever we look at any of these maps. There's two different ways to look at it. There's an absolute scale where you set the upper and lower um, limits of the measure that we're going to take. And let's say we're talking about curvature. We'll talk about the flattest curve that you want to select and the steepest curve that you want to select, as well as the steps of differentiation of color on these maps. So you may want to select for example, half diopter uh, steps, which is you know, quite common. You could select higher or smaller amounts of steps. These are absolute, and so when you're comparing different patients, the colors will mean the same thing. A normalized scale is where you look at what the values are for that particular cornea, and you kind of compress the colors and the values on the scale just to cover the range that's present on that cornea. So if you're looking at the same patient, you can utilize normalized scales and look for differences. But it's very difficult to compare one patient to the next utilizing a normalized scale because they will, the colors will be different values for different patients. Now the axial map is very, very good for determining at the apex the prescription power and curvature change. The tangential maps, as I'll show you in a moment, are very, very good for looking at centration of treatment because tangential maps give you more detail of the changes in curvature on the cornea. The refractive power map, to be honest with you, looks a heck of a lot like the axial or sagittal curvature map. And we utilize this map very often to measure the treatment zone diameter after corneal reshaping. 
all of these maps, if you really want to measure the effect of corneal reshaping, are best evaluated when you use what we call difference or subtractive maps. We have the pretreatment values, we have the post-treatment values, and we do a difference map. And so you can do a difference map for axial or tangential or refractive power or elevation. And we'll show you that in a moment. Here we can see a normalized uh, scale. And this is uh, a scale that's showing us axial or sagittal curve in the upper left, tangential in upper right, elevation in lower right, and refractive power in lower left. And now we normalize that scale. And you can see it looks different. It's the same patient, the same values, but we've just kind of compressed the values here in this um, uh, relative scale. Now we can see here an axial or sagittal curvature map for measurement of apical curve change or apical power change. So we can actually take our cursor, put it right at the apex of treatment, and get a number. And we can see that compared to the pretreatment value and tell us how much curvature or how much, in essence, diaptic power has changed from our corneal uh, reshaping treatment. Here we can see the patient utilizing a tangential curvature map. You can see it's more detailed. So this can tell you where the actual centration of the treatment is. And so if you want to look at decentration of treatment or centration of treatment, best looked at with these tangential uh, maps. And here we see a refractive power map where we're measuring the actual treatment zone as you can see along that horizontal diameter. We can notice that the treatment zone is not perfectly circular, but it's fairly circular, maybe slightly uh, oval along the horizontal. That's a pretty well-centered treatment, a pretty nice treatment in terms of its size and shape and location. So we talked about the comparison maps, the baseline topographic maps for comparison to post-treatment. We compare initial pretreatment maps to subsequent post-treatment maps over time. The actual post-treatment map and the difference map based on post-treatment is the true indication of the closed eye positioning and effect of the treatment lens. So although we like to look at lenses on eyes, the true matter is that what's important is what happens to the cornea. And we know where the lens is while they're sleeping based upon what happens to the topography, as we'll see in a moment. Utilization of these different maps show the true change induced by corneal reshaping treatment. And here we can see a classic example, a refractive power map. We have pretreatment in the middle. We have post-treatment on the left. It looks, you know, OK, I can see it flattened there. The, the refractive power is definitely reduced. You can see by the green uh, located right here. But look what happens when we do a subtractive map. And take this as the baseline, subtract here, and this shows you how large and how well constructed in terms of its circular uh, nature and the fact that we have full pupil coverage on this refractive power map. This is, shows you the effect of a difference map versus just looking at the post-treatment map. Now let's look at some others, a slightly decentered treatment utilizing sagittal curvature. Now this is all, the, the maps I'm going to show you are all difference maps going from sagittal to tangential to um, refractive power and elevation, all the same patient. And we can see pretreatment in the middle, post-treatment on the left, and the difference on the right. That's sagittal curvature, same patient tangential. So actually, not too bad. Now, this is the one that we really want to see the location uh, or centration of treatment. Now, when we use that tangential map, what we thought here on the sagittal map was a little decentered. When we do the tangential, it doesn't look that bad. Look where the pupil outline is in that uh, kind of dashed uh, line for the pupil. You see the treatment's actually pretty well centered. Here we have the refractive power. And you notice it looks quite a bit like the uh, axial or sagittal curvature map. And here we have the same patient in elevation change. So that blue in the center on the difference, uh, A minus B, as you can see that little blue area in the center, that shows you that we've lowered the apex of that cornea reduced elevation due to corneal reshaping effects. And here, utilizing a different topography system, we can see the axial in A, the tangential in B, and the refractive power uh, in C, all using uh, subtraction maps or different difference maps. What about um, some of the key measures and predictive indicators for uh, corneal reshaping outcomes? Well, one of the things we like to look at are SIMKs. 
Now we can look at that on topography, but we also can get that from auto Ks or manual Ks. Generally speaking, uh, if we're dealing with, and of course it does relate directly to the amount of correction we want to achieve, if we want to achieve greater amounts of correction, higher degrees of myopia, it's always going to have better outcomes when the corneal curvatures are a bit steeper. But when we see patients who have anything at 40 or below, I, I get very un, uh, uncomfortable in treating those patients in lower degrees of success. Not impossible, definitely not impossible. We're looking for indicators. But what's even better is to get the apical curvature radius. And you can use this on the curvature map using the sagittal or, or, um, or axial map, taking your cursor and putting right at the apex of the cornea. Again, steeper, better. We like to see them over 42 diopters. But again, you have to relate that to the uh, desired refractive correction you want to achieve. What about the corneal asphericity, or what we like to call the eccentricity or E value? Corneas with higher E values uh, in a prolate nature, meaning that they're steeper in the center and flattened to the periphery, they tend to do better as well. We like to see our E values generally at 0.5 or greater. Again, can we successfully treat patients with 0.4, sometimes 0.38 and 0.39? Absolutely, I've seen it uh, and we've done it many times. And surely a patient who has a lower E value, I'm not going to um, rule out treatment. But sometimes you put all this data together. Perhaps we have a lower E-value cornea, a flatter cornea, and a higher desired refractive change, maybe a minus 450. That would be something I would have a conversation with the patient and say, you know, your likelihood of success is guarded based upon these factors. Would they want to try to do corneal reshaping? Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't based upon that uh, information. Corneal diameter also plays a role because corneal diameter influences corneal sagittal height. And many of the calculations that some of the manufacturers or designers of these lenses use, use corneal diameter information in helping uh, understand the corneal sagittal height. Keep in mind that corneas that are larger ha are corneas that have greater sagittal height. Um, so if we have steeper curvature, we're going to have greater sagittal height. If we have larger corneas, we're going to have greater corneal sagittal height. If we have higher E values, we're going to have less corneal sagittal height. That corneal will flatten more towards the periphery. So we'll see in, a, um, in an example here, well, oh, by the way, this happens to be a Pentacam four-map refractive printout where we're looking at uh, corneal uh, curvature and sagittal curvature, upper left, elevation on the front, elevation on the back, and global pachymetry. But what I wanted to show you here was the, some of those key indicators. Here we have sim Ks in curvature. Here we have asphericity. We have it set for a Q value, but that's basically a negative of E value. So if you want to know what the E value in this case would be, it would be plus 0.21, a low E value. Here we have pupil diameter, and that gives us an idea kind of in you know, room illumination or slightly dark, not true dark illumination, what the pupil is. And you can give that as, a, as an idea of whether to be concerned about pupil diameter. Here we have an indication from an oculus uh, keratograph um, where we have a patient where corneal diameter is at 11.86. Uh, again, an important indicator of corneal sagittal height. Most corneas are falling in the middle 11s to uh, upper 11s to lower 12 uh, in terms of uh, corneal diameter. Now here's an example of where you can have the same central corneal curvature and various E values. The cornea that has the greatest E value is going to have the lowest sagittal height, as we'll see in a moment. There's a cornea with a high E value. Look at the sagittal height from the apex of the cornea to this cord. That's the sagittal height at this distance. Now, the same cornea with a little bit less of an E value. It doesn't flatten as much. You can see there's a difference here in corneal sagittal height, a little bit. The next one, even a little bit more. And the final one, even a little bit more. So as we go to a lower and lower E value, the corneal sagittal height actually does increase. Now, what happens if we have inaccurate assessment of sagittal height? If we're calculating a lens and we underestimate the corneal sagittal height, that lens is going to fit flat. And when that lens fits flat, it typically will decenter superiorly and will make the treatment zone also decenter superiorly, which can cause visual distress. If we overestimate corneal sagittal height, 
then we're going to result in a steeper fit, which will tend to not give us enough treatment. Those steeper fits will not exert enough influence on the cornea to change uh, the, um, the corneal curvature. So keys to successful corneal reshaping, a well-centered lens, appropriate relationship between the sagittal height of the lens and the sagittal height of the cornea. We talked about uh, fitting methods, and here we have diagnostic lens fitting methods, empirical fitting methods, topography-based fitting methods, and combinations. The Probably the most well-known diagnostic lens fitting method is with Paragon CRT system, where there are available fitting sets of 100 lenses and fitting calculators to select the initial lenses. These patients can be fit in the chair and can be dispensed out of this diagnostic lens inventory. It's actually a dispensing inventory. Uh, empirical fitting is common in many different systems. Some just base them on manifest refraction and keratometry. Others uh, will base them on manifest Ks and corneal diameter. And a lot of these do have a very high success rate. We were involved in a study called the SMART study. We utilized one, one of these systems where we just used manifest refraction, K, and corneal diameter, and the first fit success, where we didn't have to change the lens after that first empirically fit lens, was over 80%. Um, and for example, Paragon has an empirical fitting system called the CRT sure fit method, and others utilize it as well. Topography-based fitting utilizes sagittal height and mathematically determines tier layers under the lens. Uh, in order to do that, you better have good and precise, accurate, reliable measurements of corneal parameters uh, and very precise uh, ability to fabricate these lenses as well. And we can see here an example of a tear film under the lens. And one of the things I want to show you, very important, is that under the treatment zone here, even though the lens with fluorescein looks like it's bearing on the cornea, there is a thin tear film, often 5, 8, 10 microns. Keep in mind that studies have shown that under 20 microns of tear film thickness, it looks like the lens is bearing. So a well-fit corneal reshaping lens will have anywhere from 3 to 10 microns or so of actual tear film under the treatment zone. We don't want it bearing on the cornea. That will call, cause corneal staining and irritation when there's direct contact. So don't be surprised that you won't be able to tell that there's tear film there because a normal human can't not uh, resolve uh, anything under 20 microns of tear thickness with fluorescein. Here's an example of the Paragon CRT topography-based software fitting system. And I'll show you an example. Uh, this came off of an article that we wrote, uh, I think it was sometime last year. Here we can see an initial lens design of the CRT uh, that was fit that ended up with too low of corneal clearance centrally. There's just, it's almost bearing directly and a tight uh, peripheral system. As you can see, there's not a lot of edge clearance. So both along the vertical and horizontal, we have inadequate central clearance and inadequate peripheral clearance. Well, you know the parameters, uh, many of you uh, who have worked with uh, Paragon CRT, we have reverse zone depth and landing zone angle to, uh, to influence corneal uh, lens sagittal height relationship to the cornea. Here we changed it, and what ended up happening was we still had inadequate uh, peripheral clearance, but we had too much excessive central clearance uh, approaching over 25 microns. And then further modification of parameters ended up with an excellent uh, simulated fit where we had appropriate, maybe a little about 10 microns of central clearance and more adequate peripheral clearance, both along 360 degrees around the lens. Other systems use combination methods, like the BE retainer system, has diagnostic lenses that are used for trial, and then utilizes topography-based elements as well. What about follow-up care? There are many things that we're going to do, and actually Dr. Press will talk about this in greater detail in a couple of weeks. Uh, what we do at the dispensing visit, the fact that we do a 24-hour visit with lens on the next morning after the initial uh, night of wear, uh, depending upon the initial refractive error, we may or may not do a 72-hour. We tend to do a one-week. We do a, a one-, three-, and six-month visit, and then typically request or uh, have our patients seen uh, at six-month intervals thereafter. Any unscheduled visits, of course, uh, as needed. So keys to success in corneal reshaping, well, most important is practitioner knowledge and education and ultimate experience. We want our staff to buy in. 
We want to train them properly. We want them to be knowledgeable and develop skills in this area. We have to put in place office systems that allow us to do things properly. Fee management we'll talk about in the third webinar, very, very important because we are in business and for us to be able to provide these care uh, systems to patients, we have to be able to be profitable. Patient education, very critical, and we'll talk later on about internal and external marketing strategies as well. So our next webinar is scheduled for uh, July 31st, and my associate and partner, Dr. Uh, Daniel Press, will be talking about um, the various types of designs of corneal reshaping lenses during that talk, as well as problem solving. Okay, we fit the patient, well, they're coming back, and we have some issues. So uh, I'm real excited to uh, listen in, as you will, on Dan's uh, presentation. And then I'll take over once again uh, sometime in August uh, talking to you about uh, practice management issues uh, relating to corneal reshaping. So I want to thank everybody for their attention. And we do have about eight or 10 minutes now uh, where we can take some questions. So I'm going to let Ken get back on the line. And if he's been kind of keeping track of some questions, I'll address them. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Iden. That was awesome. Um, yeah. And just to reiterate, uh, don't forget that uh, there are two um, web, web sessions coming up that there will be again. Uh, the next one will be on Wednesday, July 31st. And the third and last installment would be Wednesday, August 14th. So uh, if anyone has uh, a question, uh, please uh, go ahead and put it into the question box. We have uh, three actual questions that cover the same <clears throat> cover the same uh, topic, and that is um, regarding refractive surgery indications uh, for post LASIK, post RK. Uh, are they contraindicated for corneal reshaping? Excellent question. Uh, the answer is no, uh, with a caveat. In other words, those are surely challenging cases. We have uh, managed and fit a good number of patients who have had um, suboptimal uh, refractive surgery outcomes, both from LASIK and PRK uh, cases, as well as RK cases. The uh, caveat is the degree of irregularity. What works best are patients who have had good outcomes in terms of their centration of treatment, but just inadequate outcomes. So they haven't achieved their target. So an example would be, you know, you have a 7-diopter, 8-diopter myope, has um, a certain corneal thickness. The doctor says you have a one-shot at this because your cornea is not thick enough to do an enhancement. We have treatment, and there's a diopter and a half of residual myopia or a diopter of residual myopia. Those cases, once they're stabilized, we have been able to perform corneal reshaping. The calculation of the parameters of those lenses, a little bit more uh, complex and truly beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. That's sort of a, uh, a lecture series in and of its own. Um, but they're very challenging, but they're also extremely rewarding. So the answer is yes, but. <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to interject something, too, as far Please as do. the uh, this indication is not FDA approved uh, like it is right. for uh, uh, hyperopic correction. Um, but again, we get calls every day um, regarding these types of patients because they are definitely uh, in need of some kind of visual correction. Um, I will say and that... And I think I, I, will add, I will add in one other thing, Ken. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about you know, non-FDA approved, that we would call off-label application of this treatment modality. And I will try to include that in the last of the webinars. How do we approach off-label? What ways can we protect ourselves, put ourselves in the safest position from a medical legal standpoint? So I will talk about that on that third webinar. Perfect, because we get a lot of questions about that. Okay, um, the next question here is, um, what is your first lens choice and your backup uh, for a second lens choice? Um, so I'm not going to answer that question. No, that I would figured be inappropriate. Not. I figured that's not. an inappropriate question. That's about asking about how much you charge. Oh, uh, what I was, yeah, what what I said, I I really mean. I <laughs> I haven't met a corneal reshaping lens design that I didn't like. They all work. 
They all work well. Again, the decision is relationships with your laboratories and the design methodology involved that makes you feel most comfortable. But I will tell you, all of them work and work well. Correct. Okay, um, another question we have about solutions. Do you like thinner or thicker wetting solutions under the lens upon application? And then the second so, part of that Sorry, Barry. The second part of that question is, what is the NSAID therapy? NSAID therapy? Yeah, well, it got great. me on that one. Do you know what that one is? No. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay. Uh, but the first question is the solution for application. I've, uh, it's very patient-dependent. There are some patients who, from a comfort standpoint, do much better with highly viscous solutions. So, for example, one of the ones we use quite a bit is Cellu-Visc, which is a non-preserved, highly viscous uh, solution that will fill the bowl with, with application. Uh, and many patients find that they're the most comfortable when applying the lenses that way. Then I have other patients who honestly prefer not filling the lens with anything and just taking it out of their stored solution and putting it directly on, on their eye. So it's very patient-dependent. We do typically start patients out with a kind of a mid-viscosity uh, application uh, solution. We tend to use, um, you know, just to let you know what we do at our practice, we tend to use sustained balance a lot because of a mid-viscosity. Uh, mid we also use Oasis Tears Plus for application as well. The, uh, those cases that require higher viscosity, we do go to cellulose. Let's see. Uh, okay, now this person that asked a question about the NSAID has said that it was on the slide and it was uh, something about BROM room day for pain on insertion. Oh, okay. Now I know. You're talking about NSAIDs. Okay, yeah. I, I, I missed it. I thought it was a certain type of therapy. Okay, sorry about that. So patients, uh, when we first start, comfort is an issue, just like with any rigid lens. And a lot of times, we're dealing with younger patients in this population who are a bit more sensitive. And to be very frank with you, some of them, it's their parents who really want them to do this therapy for myopia stabilization. So getting them to be comfortable is very important. And here are some of the uh, kind of the ways that we've been successful in practice. Number one, initial application of either a diagnostic or the initial um, dispensed lens. We're firm, strong believers in doing that with preparacane on the eyes. There's no question about it that it has made life much more pleasant in the office for all of my staff, the doctors, and for the patients. Believe me, that lens is going to be on more than the 8 to 10 or 12 minutes that uh, will be required for the, uh, for the preparacane to wear off. So for dispensing, undoubtedly, we use preparacane. But we also, in the more sensitive patients, and I would say it probably is about 10% of the patients we will utilize non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops for the first three to five nights. Uh, as you know from those of us who treat corneal abrasions, the use of NSAIDs definitely improves comfort. And we've utilized this for corneal reshaping lenses and initial adaptation to rigid lenses. So maybe the first three to five nights, we'll have them apply anywhere from one to three drops of NSAID onto the eyes up to, you know, from between 10 minutes to uh, five minutes before application of the lens, and we have found that it makes them much more comfortable and their adaptation go better. That's what he was talking about or she uh, was talking about. Okay, great. Again, an off-label use, by the way, I must say that that is an off-label use of an NSAID. Okay, well, there's no more questions. So first of all, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Iden, for your time and expertise. Uh, it was a very informative session, and we certainly look forward to the second and third installments. Now, for those people who have joined us this evening, I, I, I certainly want to thank you for joining us and hope you will uh, join us again for um, the, the other two sessions. This is being recorded, and the second and third session will also be recorded, and we will let you know where it will be posted, either on the Paragon Vision website or the Oculus website, or both. So. We will certainly let you know on that. But, again, thank you again, Dr. Iden. Appreciate it very much. Good night, everybody.